Welcome to the Raise Podcast. I'm Carol Barwick. We're here to raise your confidence and inspire your creativity. Each episode, we will have a different guest who will be discussing our Raise Word. The Raise Word is a word that will encourage you or empower you and at times inspire you to explore the word a little more for yourself. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to The Raise Podcast. I'm Carol Barwick. We love looking at and exploring words here at The Raise Podcast. We've looked at hope and we've looked at harmony and relax. And today we're going to look at a really interesting word, and that is the word resilience. And I have an amazing lady with us today to talk to us all about it. Now, she is Dr. Rebecca Dinsdale, and the doctor bit is very important for all we're going to talk about. And she has got to be one of the most resilient people I know. So I'm going to be quiet and welcome, Rebecca. Good morning, Rebecca. How are you doing? Good morning. I feel very blessed to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, just before we um, dive into everything we're going to talk about today, a little bit of a caveat. We are recording in the summer holidays. Uh, and so you may hear really tiny faint things of my son running around and being a normal summer holiday boy. It's quite exciting because he is going to be our next podcast guest. So if you uh, hear him, all you can think to yourself is, aha, we'll be hearing from him next episode. But apologies if there's any background kind of holiday noise, there always is. Becca, have you got any background holiday noise or has it gone out for a walk? I've done my best to negate <laughs> it, but um, my husband's just brought the puppy back, having tried to wear her out. So she's outside and we've got double glazing. Yeah. P puppy helps with your social media, doesn't he, Becca? Oh, <clears throat> I am. Um, I'm probably. Um, how can I put it? The Mrs. Pumphrey of puppies. If you've ever seen All Creatures Great and Small with her dog, Tricky Woo, right. that is me. <laughs> OK, you might have to unpack that a bit for us later on. <laughs> oh, but there's a lot to unpack. <laughs> And I think it's fair to say that Christy loves to unpack things. So oh. um, <laughs> adventures, I think I've always thought you need to do a podcast, Becca. And I think you and Christy need to do a podcast together. <laughs> She'd but, probably eat the, eat the laptop. Yeah, I, I completely believe that. Cable, cable first and then the, the rest of the machine, I would imagine. <laughs> if you've seen the film Marley and Me about a very destructive Labrador, that is easy in comparison to Christy. Right, okay. Well, listeners, if you've got pets and you're listening this morning, uh, yeah, let's hope that they're not too destructive as you listen to the podcast this morning. <laughs> but her great attribute is her utter unconditional love for everybody. She is bounding with joy with every person she encounters. So I will sacrifice the odd chair, <laughs> odd garments, the fireplace, <laughs> I could keep going. But she sees everybody as a greatest friend she could ever have. And there's a great lesson in that. So, Becca, they say dogs are always like their owners. And we'll leave Ooh. that there. <laughs> <laughs> Becca does not eat chairs. She does not eat chairs, listeners. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> so we are going to talk about the word resilience today, Becca. What does that word mean to you? It means so many things on so many levels, mm. but I think it's a crusade of courage to live a life of loving purpose. And lots of people don't need to be very resilient in life because life is kind to them. They are fit, they are well, they are strong, they are supported, they are safe. But as soon as the pillars of normal life and health are taken away, you need what I would call super resilience, a depth of fortitude and love and faith to get you through hourly difficulties that don't go away, that need managing, so that you're not self-piteous or embittered or less than that you could be. It doesn't mean I'm endlessly positive and optimistic, but what it does mean is I have a level of contentment and appreciation that is grounded in my faith. So for me, resilience is a way of life, and then life becomes abundantly joyous when we can cope with the bumps and the hurdles and the injustices and the unfairnesses 
and the gifts that every day presents. What a super explanation. Now, I always do my best to truly listen and hear what's been said. And so much has been said. I honestly don't know where to start. But I introduced you um, at the top as Dr. Rebecca. And I know that that has not been an easy journey and has taken you full throttle into your journey of resilience. So could we start there, please? Can you tell us a little bit of that journey? Yes. Well, I am very fortunate to have had examples of great faith around me. That, that's really where it starts. Yeah. And had I not had that, I don't know where I would be. So it's by the grace of God in all things. And the dictionary sort of definition of resilience is about bouncing back after a little bit of adversity. Yeah. Now, there's a point where you can only bounce so far and you're stretched. You know, you've lost the hooks, tension laws. So I have had, by most people's standards, a big ton of illness. Right. But it's not just what's happened to me. It's really essentially what's happened to my parents, too. And I'm an only child of only children. So we are, have been a very tight unit. There aren't many of us, but thank God, I hope we've been uh, very committed to one another. Mm. Illness has evolved within our lives to not only dominate them, but um, in many respects, define the outcomes of what we could manage. So when I was a little girl, I had in many respects, everything. I was immensely fortunate and I hang on to that with great gratitude. My grandmother, Ivy, had been a medical missionary to China with the Irish Presbyterian Church in the 1930s, learned Chinese in a year and run a mission hospital. Wow. She had an epic faith. She was un, un, unassailed in her devotion. So you have that example to start with. And lots of people think Ivy's remarkable because she went to China, which she was, you know, she's a young woman on her own. Off she goes. The bit that's really remarkable is the difficulty she survived around going to China. So she grew up with affluence and had an alcoholic father and all their money was just, dis well, disappeared and they were hungry children. And I think somewhat physically abused. She didn't get married till she was very um, more, much more mature. And her husband, my grandpa, bravest man on the planet, had volunteered to go to war. He didn't have to go and he was badly bombed in Malta. So he then had a life of war wounds, three heart attacks and a stroke. She had multiple miscarriages and her faith was unassailed. So there's the bedrock. Ivy is my um, great gift and guru. Wow. There's where it starts. Mm. And she had a promise box. I don't know if you've ever seen a promise box, mm. but it's a little tatty box full of, well, the new ones aren't tatty, but hers <laughs> is a hundred years old. And every morning I would go to her house before school and we would have a promise. And when you're giving a promise school to a four-year-old, a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, you are grounding your day in faith. And the more I think about that now, what a remarkable gift to start the day and your life. I was with, you know, my Ivy. Mm. So I had enormous amounts of time with her. And what I saw was a thinking, evolving, giving faith. She was always looking to contribute, but she was an immense introvert. So that, that, there's the real story. Wow. My story is Ivy's story. She was as shy as a lamb. I am not shy. She was small. She was dignified. She was very graceful. She was elegant and quiet. And she called me her Geordie Tornado. Mm. And the bit that's really funny is that she would, she would worry all the time for me because I was a very effervescent child, full mm. of bounce and energy. And she'd say, no, Beck, no, all the time. And yet she pushed me all the time. So, you know, when I would take school assemblies at seven, she was the proudest girl in the world, but she'd be terrified at the same time. Wow. So that's really the start of the journey. My father is her only child after multiple miscarriages. He is the bravest and wisest of men. He is his mother's son. And at seven, um, he became very unwell when I was a little girl. So when your parents are suddenly hospitalized and they don't come back for months, you, you, it's terrifying. Yeah. So illness hit us very sharply. He had a trajectory in a career that was, you know, euphoric and did very, very well professionally. But his physical health really was very ha hammered in his early 30s. So much so that, you know, we couldn't play games. We didn't do sports. We had a, you know, we had a quiet life. He then later really found out that that was ME. 
you know, it was post viral fatigue in those days, but people didn't understand that. And this had been a man who had been athletic and run a very large organization to being not being able to get out of bed with multiple systems failing. He managed to claw his way back somewhat and went on, got another promotion, but his health was always frail. Anyway, I saw we had been dominated for a long time about dad can't walk too far, we've got to be careful. We, you know, he went to work, but you know, we weren't going to parties and doing things much, but we had a lovely, lovely life together. And you would think I would see that, how precious health and energy were, but at 17, I had been fit and strong and gone canoeing holidays and you know I'd been a good girl at school and lots of church and county choir and brass band and lots of exams and you know I was a role model student but I got glandular fever and like people who've got COVID and you know long Epstein-Barr really is what happened to me and that transcended into very severe ME so there's two of us in the house very unwell. And at 17, I was dying to go to university. You know, I wanted to go to parties and find a new church and join the band and you know, yeah. fundraise and do all the things and go in the library. And it was all ruined overnight. And I can tell you the date and I can tell you the time. And what it resulted in was not a bad couple of weeks. It was a bad couple of decades. And what that meant was between 12 and 40 weeks a year, housebound, bedbound or hospital from the age of 17 till my late thirties. Wow. That was a hard road. Mm. The core of it was that I knew I was loved. I knew I was safe. And if this was to be my life, it was a grit your teeth, get through and see what we can do with the tiny amount of energy that I had. So really I've spent, uh, I'm now 48. I've been going a long time at this, but I have really mastered, I think, an act of appreciation, acceptance, and contributing where I can with that which I have, and knowing that there is a purpose for me, but I'm probably not going to be running marathons, climbing mountains, traveling. I've never been on a plane. Sadly, I haven't had any children, but I try and be a good auntie. I've tried to make something with that which I had. Wow. Wow. You love sunflowers, and it can see why you know the idea of the them drawing energy from the sun but the the picture that comes to mind is is that miraculous mustard seed and that tiny little seed of faith which has grown so much in so many um and so many people go through things but not everybody is able to be generous with that little bit that they have and yeah. the generosity that that you have is is incredible it really yeah. is incredible and um you know I'm, I'm I'm sure you know that one of the reasons I do this podcast is I want to encourage the guests as much as the people listening um and I think you'll agree those listening that that faith is absolutely incredible Becca and that generosity that goes with it um what has been good for you about resilience? It's a way of life. And I think in many respects, I teach a lot of my clients and readers that now. Yeah. Because the, on my, I had my grand's good news Bible and it was, it's so raggy now, it barely opens. But I read that Bible every morning, however half dead I was, even if it was just two or three sentences or a promise from the promise box or a devotional. And it set me up for the day. I often did something at lunchtime as to wrote a gratitude journal. I did everything I possibly could because thank God I had good mental health and I had a deep spirituality. So even though I would often be bedridden for weeks and months at a time with physical sim symptoms and systems going crackers, I think that's the gracious word to use, crackers, mm. is I thought, what can I actually control here? So what can I actually succeed at? Because you can't succeed at much when the biggest thing you can manage to do is have a shower. Yeah. So the business of trying to find some light in it, the sunflower analogy and the mustard seed and the, I opened up the epistles a lot and also about you know, how there's an awful lot in the Bible about keeping going through difficulty. Yeah. And I always think I had a lovely woman come to one of my services once and I, I preached about that I found Christ 
most inspiring because he was courageous. Yeah. And, you know, I like the miracles. I like all the other things. But it was the, a woman said to me, pet, he had nout but trouble from the minute <laughs> he was born. <laughs> In the most gorgeous northeastern accent. <laughs> Petty had nout but trouble, nout but grief. And the realization that this lovely woman in the middle of Sunderland said that to me mm. was absolutely, and look at the example. And I drew such strength from it that it got me through the difficult hours. That does not mean they were easy hours. Yeah. It was get to lunchtime, avoid hospital, avoid an ambulance. And the other thing about especially severe ME is there is nothing to help you. You are, in many respects, completely on your own. And um, if good thinking had put this right, I would have got, I'd be back up a mountain. You know, if I'd, I'd done it, if I tried hard enough to retrain and refuel and do all the things to build up, I was walking one lamppost distance before I would collapse. You know, it was that severe. Yeah. So I would have got there if I could have fixed this. But what I also knew was I had to do all I possibly could to get as well as I could. Not fully well, maybe, but look for three, five percent gains. So resilience to me is about a faithful trust and it's doing all that you can do with what you have. And knowing I think a lot of people think life should be parties, holidays, happy days, Instagram house perfect kids, beautiful marriage, nothing goes wrong, work is fine. You know, you could sing a song about expectations and mm -hmm. assumptions. And when people begin to realize that you have to have a crusade of trying to hang on to your most joyous, lovely self through the adversity and try and be stronger, wiser, firmer and deeper because of it, then I think you're living as well as you can with whatever's going on in your life. Wonderful. So this thought came to me this morning, and I think it's important. What is bad about resilience? That is a clever question. Excellent. You are a professor of questions. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure if we're going to be able to answer them, but yes, yeah, I like asking yeah. questions. <laughs> well, in one of my books, I have a phrase called quality questions make quality lives. Mm. And you see, most of the evidence presents itself to us. We just don't realize it's the evidence and the outcomes of our actions and intentions. Wow. Can, you say, can you say that again? Say that again, please. Look, that yes. Took me a lot of before we write the, before we there. buy the book so that we can then highlight it. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, say it again, please. Right. Well, I, I, I work mainly one to one yeah. uh, as a coach and a counselor, but people come to me with situations. And what normally happens is we find coping strategies to manage them. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Now, the evidence of our, our behavior is in our lives. You know, if we've cleaned our teeth enough, our teeth will be in a reasonable state. So the evidence is the state of the teeth. The action is the cleaning of them. And the intention is to do it as often as you need to. Okay. So I think about what does, I, I tried to be an academic for a long time. And one of the great questions of academia is what does the evidence tell us? And most of us spend our time looking for what our feelings tell us. And I always tell my clients, our feelings are not facts. Okay. They're like birds that fly around in us. What we need is the rocks of the evidence. So the evidence of our lives is just around us, you know, the outcomes. And then if we backtrack that to our actions, how did we participate in this? And then, quite frankly, what was our intention in it? So when you're managing very limited energy, you have to examine your intention much more because you have less energy to spend. So if I'm doing something because I know it's the right thing to do, I know it's wise, I know it will be demanding, and I know there'll be goodness at the end, God willing, I'm clear. If I'm doing something because somebody's pressuring me, somebody's not behaving very well, somebody has already behaved in a disappointing way, then I push and it's not wise and I don't have wise enough boundaries, there's an outcome there of, of what happened. And I spent a lot of years saying yes to things that I really was not well enough to do. I had no ability to say no, I had no ability to actually really look after myself. And what I teach a lot of my people now, which is amazingly ironic, is kind boundaries that are not brutal to anybody, they're not barbarous, but they allow the light in them to shine ever brighter. 
what an absolute ray of sunshine Becca is. If you'd like some sunshine in your life, do come and join us over in the Rays Facebook group. Find us on Rays, raising confidence, inspiring creativity. Back to the episode. So we've looked a little bit about that, that the possibility of resilience being a negative if you're doing it for the wrong reason. So intention is very important, isn't it? In And motivation, I think, as well. Uh, there's a verse I love in the Bible about, um, you know, man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. And I think motivation is incredibly important um, when you're setting out to do anything, really. And I love the idea of, you know, as you said, that that evidence, because that's what people see, isn't it? People see the evidence, they see the action, they see that you've pushed it too far and you now can't manage other things. And I mean, I find that really difficult having this long COVID journey. I, I feel like I'm constantly wanting to um, give people reasons why I'm either pushing myself or not able to do things. It feels like a constant battle. You've had this life for an awfully long time now, Becca. How do you manage those expectations, questions? And I've put that in inverted commas. And people listening, I'm doing it again. I'm doing actions and nobody can see me. I'm doing those little quote marks like they're doing friends. Um, those questions that people probably don't have, but we assume they they sh must have they must have questions about why I'm able to do this and I'm not able to do this how do you manage those well again that's the most insightful question so thank you for it and to be able to talk about faith in such a comfortable way is, is a gift to me so I want to say that before I say anything else mm. motivation and resilience I often used to say are the same coin just different sides okay and I used to do lots of motivational speaking because I was the girl who had, you know, kept a sunny disposition and got a degree and a master's and a doctorate despite being half dead. You know, I was a poster child for it. Mm. Motivation is like willpower. It's like taking a huge breath and trying to swim underwater. You will run out of breath eventually. Resilience comes from the Latin word resurgam. I shall rise again. And you have to live a life of trying to rise again. And you will have many Easter weeks and weekends in your life. You'll have some big crises, some big follies. And what I see about resilience being negative, just to add to our previous question, mm. is that you can become so well practiced in being battered mm. that you forget that you have worth and that that's not all right. So there's the reality. And however that battering takes in life. Mm. So I used to get a lot of infections. I mean, he's a very basic um, example. I get a lot of coughs and calls which are nothing if you're well, but you see, if you've got ME or a compromised immune system, that would be three weeks in bed with a cold and everything else that came with that. And it's awful being bedridden. People don't go to bed unless they can't sit up. And I, I had been able to climb mountains and run triathlons. So what I had to learn there was that it was not all right that I kept going to places where people had bugs and would cough all over me. And my resilience had to adapt because I could have kept going back. That would have been very resilient or I could have stayed in bed. So what I had to learn to do is say, please, if you've got a cough or cold or a sore throat, don't come to my house. I really love you. But if you did, I know you're my friend and I know you won't want me to suffer. So I had to quietly teach boundaries to people that was uncomfortable. But, I, you know, the great lesson of this for me was kind boundaries, wise thinking and deep appreciation. So one of the things was I had to communicate and it is a crusade, but once you've done it a few times to good people, they start to pick it up. And I have to say with a chuckle, there are a lot of people who don't pick it up, who are a bit thick and a bit selfish. And, and you know, that's, that's not a thing to say in a faithful podcast, but there is a lot of disappointing behavior out there, which will damage you. So I think um, somebody once said to me, um, it's all right, she's only got a bit of flu. And I thought, well, a bit of flu is going to floor me for months. Mm. So, and then I said, I'm sorry, I've got to go. And it became easier because I had very poorly parents as well. And I was then protecting them. Yeah. But I had to learn to protect myself as my parents would have protected me. 
that's a, it's a difficult role. There's no good being as motivated as you like if you're not resilient underneath it, because you do have to rise again. And one of the things about um, understanding that is knowing that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm. And I found great solace in the Psalms and in hymns. My mum would play the piano all the time when she was worried and it'd be hymn after hymn after hymn mm -hmm. in heavenly love abiding, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see, all I have needed thy hand hath provided. And to really believe that when you're bedridden and you're 22 is not easy. But I was safe, I was loved, I was fed, and I was holding my breath till better days came. And the fundamental part about motivation and resilience is a deep gratitude that I wasn't in hospital. I wasn't surrounded by people who were unpleasant to me. I used to sometimes watch EastEnders and say, thank God my life is not like that. Mm. You know, my <laughs> life is restricted and difficult. I'd watch the news and I would pray. Thank God that, that I'm not in the news. Thank God I'm not in the middle of Syria. Thank God I'm not in the middle of Bosnia, as it was at the time when, you know, I had a long time when the Bosnian conflict was on. Mm -hmm. So I, I cultivated a depth of appreciation for the tiny, tiny treasures of everyday life. And that sustained my resilience and my motivation. So I was thrilled that I had enough pillows. I was thrilled, and this is the most basic level of living, that I could take myself to the bathroom. Thank God I could do that with some dignity. Thank God I could go in the shower. Thank God I could sometimes go in the front room and watch half an hour of telly with mum and dad. Thank God I could sit up in the seat. So rather than, oh my goodness, my life has collapsed because it had, I had to find the, the grains and the mustard seeds. Yeah, and I love that because, because it's, you know, you're, you're saying about being the poster person and being the kind of, happy one and the positive one and yet you've just said thank god that i was able to thank god because as my life collapsed because it had so there's no it, oh it had there's there's no kind of well we're we're thanking god and we're we're saying it's not collapsed and we're having faith and it. it's not that it's no 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 the reality is mm. life is really really hard however those little things are enabling me to rise again. I don't know if you saw, um, but my eyes widened when you said about rising again, because um, I, I pride myself in finding out about the word, but I hadn't seen um, that Latin meaning, and obviously um, rising again, and then the word raise, very synonymous together. So that's that's very um, exciting and, um, and inspiring. Um, as is so much of what we've been saying I wanted to go back because I think this is important you talked about um your readers and your clients please tell us a little bit about both of those because that will unpack a little bit more about what you're up to now and what we need to be quite frankly getting from you as soon as possible <laughs> oh bless you well, I love being with you I mean you're you've been such a gift this group has been such a gift to me where I could I mean initially I found you on Facebook with our lovely Amy yeah. And um, I trust her judgment. So if she said it was good, I thought I yeah. am going to find some nice people. Big up Amy Purdy. Amazing. Absolutely. Amazing girl. <laughs> um, and what I thought was to be at peace on social media about faith. What, what a gift. Thinking, giving faith. So what am I doing now? Well, I think the reality is, is I'm trying to use all of that trouble. And there was a ton of it to good purpose. Because what it has done, and especially there are two other elements to add to this, which I haven't mentioned so far, which were beyond horrific. My own illness was difficult. Mm. But thank God I could think. That's what it comes down to. I could think. I still had my faculties very strongly. And thank God I didn't have too much brain fog. So I managed to do A-levels one at a time on two hours of school a week in a taxi. That was not easy and it was not fun. I did a part-time degree on one sixth time at my local university, very, very slow, part-time master's degree, part-time doctorate. By then I could write and speak pretty well. Mm. I could present well to academics. It's just they didn't know I would have to go to bed afterwards <laughs> and yeah. recover. Yeah. So I was still essentially that seven-year-old little girl who could take a school assembly and light the place up because I was effusive and I was too much. You know, lots of people tell us we're too much. But God made me the way I am. He didn't make me an introvert. Oh, amen. <laughs> you 
know, but he also made me an extrovert who didn't have enough energy to sustain it. So yeah. I had to value that, that I was fearfully and wonderfully made, even though I was a bit broken and a bit ruined. Yeah. But the bit that, that is, so I got to the end of as much education as I could get whilst I could. Yeah. And I was unemployable. You know, I was still having about 20 weeks a year in bed where I needed full-time care. And just as I started to improve by my essentially early 30s, and I improved because I had, I, I wrung out every possible treatment, you know, I never drank a drink of pop, you know, I did everything to be well yeah. and look for 3% gains. But my mom got early onset dementia in her 50s. Oh gosh. So I have to say my knees were bending there. Yeah. And it, you know, physical illness is a thing to manage. And in some ways, you can talk about resilience and hope and faith, but kindness saves people's sanity. And we were absolutely surrounded by loving care and support from a, a wealth of people, you know, and we didn't have a lot of, well, we had no family, but we had a church, we had work, we had just gorgeous kindness. And that would, I send a lot of posts now and I've done so much visiting Cooley people because I wanted to pay that back. But when my mum lost her mind, I can honestly say she was in hell and we were too. Mm. And all of my illness, and my dad had been very sick too, all of that was easy in comparison to her to torture. And I'll try not to cry when I mention this, and I'm very careful about what I say because she was an introvert and she would not want this broadcast. Yeah, yeah. She'd tell me off, but there are great lessons from her sorrow. I took her funeral. Wow. And that was a monumentally difficult thing to do. But again, that was easier than the 14 years of hellish suffering that she had. And when somebody is psychotic, a severe epileptic and losing their ability to function, and she is still a middle-aged young woman, vibrant and lovely, to see that destruction to the core of her soul was, it was beyond desperate. Yeah. So I can safely say now, having looked after somebody with degenerative and psychotic illness, that there are much worse things than being a bit unwell. And that's very easy to say, but I've had immense mental health care as the carer and immense physical health experience. And you put that together and a soul is stretched because of it. Mm. And most of us are a nice round ball of blue tap or plasticine. That's how I like to think of us. Yeah. And I've had a great hammer come down and I'm all splodged and un, undignified and you know flat but what that stretching of my soul has done and there have been times when I have got into bed and not known how I'll get out the next morning because I wasn't well enough to look after her but if I didn't she would be sectioned so dealing with that level of terror and stress and fear was I have to say horrific yeah so now normal and thank God I have a bit more normal life now and she's with the Lord is I know what it is to suffer and most people don't get stretched that far even though they think what they're dealing with is a stretch yeah because I just tried to keep her safe for 14 years and the worst bit was her and, and I choose my words very careful there were times of atrocious care and the battling for care was immensely arduous but she was mine and I adored her and I was not going to let her suffer. Yeah. So the great lessons of my mother's life and deterioration was that I learned to battle for her. And I can now battle with absolute, without a second thought. And I'm not never aggressive and I'm never nasty, but I can hold a line. I can put together a strategic plan and I can get us there. And when I'm teaching my people, because you asked originally, I'm sorry, this is a really long answer. Yes. But when you said about my readers and my clients, mm. they are my treasures mm. because they are getting the fruit of all those immense lessons because they did make me wise. They made me tougher, but they also, I wanted to be stretched to the point where goodness would triumph because in the end, goodness does shine, but we do have to fight for its right. So my readers and my clients, the books I write are about joy and celebrating goodness. And my first one was called Life Joy, because I thought the joy that is, I was going to call it joy, life, hope, or faith, love, and love. And, you know, I wanted some good words together. Yeah. But Life Joy, I decided would stand for love, integrity, 
fortitude, energy, joy, order, and you. And when we put that philosophy together, when you come to me for one-to-one -one coaching, we implement all of that. And this morning I had a client and I have to stop myself from weeping with joy. Mm -hmm. So now God, all of that suffering and sorrow got me to that client this morning that I could help them along. I could be an inch in the heel of their shoe to just hold them up and say, come on treasure, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Let's see what we can do about this. Because that's what my mom would say. She, she would be right there looking after them or trying to pay for it or solve it or send my dad to pay for it and solve it. <laughs> so, so the outcome of this is that when I was unemployable, I thought, what on earth am I going to do? I was very blessed with a kind, honourable husband, but we were very dependent on his salary. I didn't earn any money till I was 36. My first client paid me £20 for life coaching. Mm. I didn't bank the cheque for months because I was so friends for her. Did you frame it? <laughs> so, so I started work at 36 and I thought, well, maybe I, maybe I could just be a bit self-employed. You know, maybe I could do some talks. And people were asking, I was doing lots of talks then about motivation and resilience for the university. So all of that sorrow and all the great lessons were the fuel for this life joy. I hope fire and sun. So my, I, start, I wrote my first book, which was Life Joy, Your Manual for Resilient Living, which is essentially a devotional to help you through each stage in life. It's an easy book to read. It's got beautiful pictures in, and it's a workbook of spirituality and care. And I worked for a decade, most of the time, as a Christian celebrant. So I took funeral services. Wow. So all of those funeral services, and I just, I did, I had to help people at the worst point of their lives because I had lived at the worst point of life for a lot of years. And my mom deteriorated so much that she was bedridden for the last five years of her life. She couldn't walk, talk, see or hear and had multiple other problems. So I understood what end of life care meant yeah. so that when those people came to me and their Nana was 99 and she'd lived a magnificent life, we could hold her up and say, thank God, thank God, thank God. Wow. This is really hard for me to say, but we are nearly at the end of our episode um, and I'm going to ask you something that I haven't asked any other guests so far but please would you come back and do another episode um, at another point in the uh, next season because um, I think you have so much to share and uh, we've not we've not had it all yet um, I know we talked about talking about grief and I think there'll be just the right time to do that so um, I'd love you to do that um, wow people listening I'm sure it's been uh I don't know if it's been as emotional as it has for you um and Becca in her wonderfully sensitive way she realized that I was about to lose it probably about 10 minutes ago um and as you know that is just fine we are as we are on the podcast um but I do want to uh just throw a challenge out as we always do um on the Ray's podcast and just say, what is your little bit? What is your 2%? What is it that um, you need to just keep doing and doing and doing? Becca, have you got anything to add to that? Oh, that's another beauty. I can't wait to come back. I just like to be your pal. Just have me. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think I have three things about the 2% that perhaps transcend all of that experience because I don't talk about any of that stuff much. I just want to be pals and normal and talk about my mad puppy and, you know, my gorgeous clients and all that lovely normal stuff of life. Yeah. Those are great. So to my three, I hope, most helpful messages would be. Yeah. Count your blessings and be the blessing. Amen. Yeah. Wherever you are. Be part of the and yet tribe. Wow. And I've had, you know, thousands of funeral clients and one-to-ones where people have had horrendous things happen to them, really viciously nasty things that didn't need to happen to them. They've had tremendously bad luck. And yet, mm, mm. and by heavens, I've seen some heroic people. And the heroic people are the people who've just gritted their teeth and not been embittered and seen what they can manage with what they've got. Mm. And finally, my biggest prayer and I, I'll say the posh version of it first for you. I used to say, help me, Lord, to help myself, mm. wherever that was. 
please give me the words, the lines, help direct me. And then I used to say in, in the most Sunderland accent possible, I'd say, come on Mara, help us. And Mara <laughs> is the word for great friend in the Northeast. And I used to find myself praying, come on Mara, help us, help us my friend. Help me to help myself or send kind help. And to live by that prayer, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, but most of us are doing much better than we think. And to remember that perspective that a thousand people would swap with us right now makes you much more powerful. Thank you. So people listening, your 2%, what is it? Are you going to remember how blessed you are today and share that with somebody else? Are you going to think about your and yet mm -hmm. and put your hope in that today? Or are you going to reach out to your Mara, whether that yeah. is whether that's God or whether that's um, a physical friend or something else that you put your faith in? What are you going to do for your two percent, Becca? We've come to the part of the podcast where um, I do a little poem, and there's been so much in this, and I do pray that God will bless this poem because as you know it comes straight from the heart and I don't know what I'm going to say um but just give me you know a couple of seconds and uh <clears throat> in the water underneath there's something glistening are you listening to the babble reach in there's something shining it's just tiny it's just a little bit but pull it out and hold it tight and slowly unfurling your fingers you'll see as the light hits that little bit is sparkling is glimmering is shining and what shall we do with that little bit, we'll pass it on. We'll give it wings. We'll watch it grow that little bit. For many of us, that's all we have, that little bit. But pass it on and watch it grow and see it shining so that you know that your little bit is yours and you are precious and worth it all okay there was no mention of resilience in that whatsoever <laughs> that doesn't need to be because it's love yeah it's it love what's love Thank you for your little bit that just radiates everywhere. And thank you for sharing that little bit with as many people as you possibly can. You've been an absolute joy this morning. And uh, as I said, I look forward to welcoming you back in the future. Rebecca, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you for all that you do and all that you liberate within us. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Raise podcast. We hope you feel raised and inspired by this episode. Whilst we're not offering face-to-face -face classes currently, we are doing online singing lessons where you can have your voice raised as well as your confidence. If you would like to find out more, please visit our website at www.raiseforall.com or find us on social media on either our Facebook or Instagram page. Take care.